On this Sunday night, this year of extreme weather just gets worse, here at home and around the world. We're on the ground in BC. This summer's wildfire season is now one of the most devastating on record. Plus, flooding in India. There's been nothing like it in nearly a hundred years. Desperate rescue efforts are underway in Kerala. Also tonight, maybe it's the Me Too effect. A new film starring disgraced actor Kevin Spacey. It didn't exactly have a grand opening. Total take for the weekend? Dozens of dollars. That's it. This is The National. Tonight, the air across BC is hot and smoky. The vast woodlands as dry as tinder. Four days into a state of emergency, the wildfires are ravenous. This map drives home the staggering size of the problem. That telltale red spells extreme danger for huge swaths of the province. The largest fire of note is the Shovel Lake wildfire. It's nearly 15 times the size of Manhattan, if you will, and it's located due west of Fort St. James. The CBC's Rafi Bujikanian starts our coverage in a community on edge. So far, firefighters have contained the flames about an hour away from Fort St. James. But for many, that's too close for comfort. More than a thousand people have already left the town and the surrounding area, including more than 300 people from Glasden Nation, now confined to hotel accommodations two hours from home. For those who have stayed behind in Fort St. James, there are lots of questions about whether they will be forced to leave. For fire officials, getting an answer is not always easy, not when all this smoke hampers their usual methods. If we're unable to use our helicopters or our aircraft to find the fire perimeter, we do our best to estimate the size of the wildfire, and we can do that with infrared heat scanning. Our crews are able to take GPS tracks from the ground, but given the large size of this wildfire, it can be difficult to get the complete perimeter mapped every single day. Some residents have chosen to battle their stress by helping the people beating back the flames. Stacy Bowman could not believe her eyes when she saw the living conditions of one group fighting fires. They were sleeping on the arena floor. Some of them have mats, some of them are on concrete. They were living off of granola bars. So she set to work with some friends to give them better options for food and accommodations. No, they really? think I'm a blender on this fire. <laughs> While residents feed their protectors, others work on starving the fires. We've rolled out one of the biggest mass water sprinkler cannon systems that North America has ever seen for municipal protection. We're here to create an impenetrable barrier um, around this town. If that barrier holds, it will help calm nerves in a town that's never seen fire threats like it has in the past two years. I think we need to do some interface work and get rid of that dead down material that kind of encircles our community and uh, reduce the fire hazard and just put the citizens' uh, minds at ease. The whole province may need to ponder those protective measures once it gets a handle on the hundreds of fires now burning. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Fort St. James. This we know is true. Where there is fire, there's smoke. A monstrous suffocating cloak that makes breathing a hazard. It's giving BC some of the world's worst air. So right now, Kelowna's air contains more particulate matter than what they're breathing in Jodhpur, India, a city the World Health Organization consistently ranks near the bottom. On a bad day, the air quality index reaches 183 there. That's considered moderately polluted. Kelowna now sits at 283, which makes it heavily polluted. Now, the scale tops out at about 500, and in the past, some Chinese cities have exceeded that. But today, China has nothing on Kelowna. As that cloak of sp smoke spreads throughout British Columbia and beyond, it's clogging lungs and grounding planes. The CBC's Anita Bath shows us the impact. The smell of campfire fills the air across much of British Columbia. The sky is hazy and the famous views are hard to make out. You live in a mountain town and can't see the mountains. In the Kootenai region, air quality may be the worst in the province, reaching what's considered hazardous levels. It's hard to do all the things we love outdoors and to enjoy our province <laughs> when you can't breathe properly. The smoke is forcing people to change their plans. 
I was actually I was supposed to go mountain biking this morning. And, uh, there's no way. You just can't. The air is no better in BC's Okanagan. Visibility is so poor, flights have been grounded. 94, number 177. Two triathlons have also been cancelled. Athletes came from as far away as Brazil and Australia, only to be met with disappointment halfway through. It would have been impossible to compete in these conditions. It's, uh, you can't see more than four or 500 metres in front of yourself. Racers say they could taste burnt wood in the air. Similar to the Blade Runner movies, the, the new movies where, where there's just, the world is covered in smoke. That BC smoke has pushed east to Alberta and Saskatchewan. Hazy skies forced an early end to Calgary's ride to conquer cancer. I don't want to put myself at risk for potential um, effects riding in those conditions. Participants were supposed to pedal more than 100 kilometers. Halfway through, they waited at a rest stop for buses to pick them up. But I had to put my mask and, and because I, I have a hard time breathing. Under these conditions, masks are common sight, but doctors say they create a false sense of security. Surgical masks don't actually uh, block uh, particle matters this small. The worry is breathing in this air day after day could lead to dire health problems long term. A reprieve is unlikely, though. The smoke is expected to get even thicker in the days to come. Anita Bath, CBC News, Vancouver. To India now, where it's not fires, but floods that are wreaking havoc. More than 350 people have died in the state of Kerala, many of them in the last week as the region goes through its worst flooding in almost a century. Heavy rains that began August the 8th have brought landslides and flash floods that swept away entire villages. In some areas, the downpour has been more than double that of a typical monsoon season. Over 800,000 people are displaced, many now crammed into relief camps set up across the entire state. Water levels have started to decrease in some areas, giving rescue workers a bit of a chance to airlift those stranded on rooftops. And for military helicopters to drop supplies to those they simply can't reach. Elsewhere, soldiers are clearing debris and building makeshift roads. What's happening in India is being felt here in Canada. Today, across the country, many celebrated India's Independence Day while also stepping up to help. Natalie Nanowski has that. Aaron Sibby is sending some of the money he earns serving dosas back to India. This is a place where I work and I ask some of my friends to donate something so that I can send to some of the guys volunteering over there. This restaurant owner is doing the same. He's been watching as floodwaters destroy the town where he owns a home. It's completely almost immersed in the water. My friends and families, yesterday night I contacted and they were all sheltering in a nearby house which is on the high plains. Many in the state of Kerala have been airlifted out, while others have been forced to cross dangerous rapids. There's an abundance of water, but none of it is clean enough to drink. Toronto's Global Medic is sending water purification systems to prevent diseases like cholera and typhoid. And they're already going to be immunocompromised because they're displaced because of the flooding, and there's a really high chance that they're going to die because of the disease. So it's critical. The road to recovery will be long. Rice and coffee plantations have been completely wiped out. India's consular general in Canada says help is needed. Uh, it's very unfortunate that Kerala has to go through this. This year has been unprecedented rains. If anybody wants to contribute, there's a CM's chief minister's relief fund and also the prime minister's relief fund. India's Prime Minister toured the area by air and promised to increase aid, while Canada's Prime Minister tweeted his condolences yesterday. In Canada, there are about 150,000 people from Kerala. Many have mounted a petition asking Ottawa to step in and send aid. Natalie Nanowski, CBC News, Toronto. So with the water starting to recede in some areas, just look at what was left on one bridge. A massive amount of plastic, garbage and debris that had been filling the river was spat back out by the flood waters. But here's the kicker. In order to clear the roads, trucks carry the garbage away, but not far. They dumped it right back into the river, angering people online who are worried this will just continue to pollute 
and clog the waterways. Now to a different mess, a political one in Washington, where Rudy Giuliani doesn't want his client, the U.S. president, taking part in Robert Mueller's investigation. But a White House lawyer, there since the beginning of Donald Trump's time in office, reportedly has been talking to Mueller. The CBC's Paul Hunter has that tonight. After a weekend at his golf resort in New Jersey, the question shouted at Donald Trump was about a White House lawyer. Now known to have spent 30 hours telling all he knows of Trump to special prosecutor Robert Mueller. Trump waved it off. His personal lawyer spoke for him on Mueller's investigation. They don't have a single bit of evidence. What's more, said Rudy Giuliani, when there are conflicting versions of events, say Trump's and someone else's, what's true depends on who's telling it. A concept that left journalist Chuck Todd gobsmacked. Truth is truth. I, I don't mean to go like... I, no, I it isn't truth. Truth isn't truth. The president of the United States says, I didn't... Truth isn't I, truth. Mr. Mayor, do you realize what... I, 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 no, I, no, no, no. This no, is going to become a wait, bad don't, 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 Thus, don't, as a kind of echo to the term alternative facts comes truth isn't truth. All of it. After the New York Times reported this man, White House lawyer Don McGahn, has indeed cooperated extensively with the Mueller inquiry with the permission of the president. Trump reportedly believed McGahn would defend him. But, says the Times, McGahn, who said to have labeled Trump King Kong, worried the president would turn on him, so he testified to protect himself. In a tweet, Trump slammed the Times article as fake, adding, McGahn was allowed to talk because I have nothing to hide. Trump likened Mueller to Joe McCarthy, the discredited 1950s senator who persecuted suspected communists in America. The Mueller inquiry wrote Trump is McCarthyism at its worst. The big question remains, will Trump himself sit down with Mueller? I'm not going to be rushed into having him testify so that he gets trapped into perjury. Whatever the impact of McGahn's testimony, Adrian, it seems clear he told investigators plenty, reportedly including stuff Trump's personal lawyers know nothing about, all of it with the potential to hurt or help the president. And I guess, Paul, I mean, of course, Mueller and McGahn are hardly the only people on Trump's mind this weekend. I guess Paul Manafort is occupying some territory there. Yeah, you know, it never stops down here. Jury's back tomorrow, just across the river in Virginia, for a third day of deliberations in Paul Manafort's trial on tax and bank fraud. Manafort was, of course, Trump's campaign manager for some of the time that Robert Mueller is investigating, but these charges are not a part of the Russia allegations per se. Still... Given Trump's constant tweets that Mueller's on a witch hunt, Trump will be watching carefully for whatever the jury decides. If Manafort is found guilty, it'd sure take a lot of the wind out of Trump's criticism of Mueller. But if Manafort's found not guilty, it's just the opposite. And you can bet Trump would take full advantage of it on Twitter and beyond. That said, whatever happens in this trial, Manafort faces another trial later this year on more serious charges, where observers note there is significantly more evidence against him than there is in this one. Bottom line, jury's back at it in the morning. Adrian. As you say, Paul, it never ends. Paul Hunter in Washington, thanks. Yeah. Some of the other stories we're tracking tonight, starting with the celebration in Winnipeg's Pakistani community amidst a political controversy. Diversity and multiculturalism is Canadian identity. Yeah, we're just here to promote diversity and culture, uh, multiculturalism. The event marked Pakistan's Independence Day, which was earlier this week, in a park named for Pakistan's modern founder. It's the same park Conservative MP Maxime Bernier singled out in a tweet last week as an example of what he called extreme multiculturalism. Days later, the park sign was vandalized, torn down. Tonight, people from all cultural backgrounds were invited, organizers say, for a celebration of diversity. And Brazil's government is sending troops to a town near the Venezuela border after this clash yesterday. Residents attacked Venezuela migrants just fleeing their country's economic chaos. The violence erupted after a local store owner was beaten. That attack was blamed on the migrants. 
Canada's Robert Wickens. Oh, that's going to be tight through there. Oh, yeah, really touch. Oh, my God. Oh. oh. Yikes. Well, that's the scene of a scary crash that halted an IndyCar race in Pennsylvania today, and it involved a Canadian driver. The CBC's Renee Filippone watches developing stories for the National on Sunday. So, Renee, uh, what the heck happened here? Well, Adrian, the racing world was on edge today at the Pocono Raceway, and it all unfolded in the early stages of the race. That's when Robert Wickens pulled up beside American Ryan Hunter Ray as they were headed into the second turn on the lap, and neither driver would back down. And that's when the cars touched wheels, setting off that chain reaction of events. And Wickens' car spun 360 degrees into the fence, and a number of other drivers were also injured. Here is one driver explaining what it was like to be on that course. I just saw a lot of smoke ahead. Uh, I was in the middle of the corner behind Ed. Uh, we had made a decent start in the race and it was just all full of smoke. And when I saw I was going to hit inch head on and I had to slam the brakes and try to get low. When I did that, I... Uh, crashes like these are so hard to look at. What do we know about Wiccan's condition now? Well, he was airlifted to hospital and officials say he is awake and responsive and suffered orthopedic injuries, which means broken bones, but they didn't say to what extent. Now, the safety cell, which the drivers are enclosed in, remained intact, which is likely what protected him. Uh, the 29-year-old from Guelph, Ontario, actually just got a permanent spot on the Indy circuit this year, even won the Indianapolis 500 Rookie of the Year Award. Uh, today's crash also injured his teammate and fellow Canadian James Hinchcliffe. He was able to walk away from the car, but Adrian, this track has made news before. Three years ago, driver Justin Wilson died from a head injury following a race at Pocono when a piece of debris from a crash bounced off the track and hit him in the head. Terrible. Renee Filipponi in Vancouver, thanks. So here's a look at what else we're working on tonight on The National. The new definition of a box office bomb. Kevin Spacey's first flick after allegations of sexual assault makes just a couple hundred dollars on opening weekend. Plus, 76 years after the failed Allied raid on Dieppe, we hear from the grandson of a vet who wants to make sure memories of the war are preserved. And one of 600 shipwrecks in Canadian waters is finally being cleaned up 30 years after it went down. Seals were dying on the ice, uh, birds were dying, uh, that hundreds, hundreds and hundreds, we were untold. More than three decades after it sank, a shipwreck off the coast of Newfoundland is finally getting cleaned up. The Manolis L went down in 1985, but only began leaking fuel following a storm just five years ago. That pollution poses a threat to the fragile ecosystem and the local economy that depends on it. So now, more than 100 people from across Canada and the U.S. are on site to help pump the oil out. The CBC's Chris O'Neill Yates joined the Coast Guard for a first-hand view of the operation near Change Islands in the province's northern coast. In this idyllic corner of Canada, the sea is life. The engine that drives everything work and play, the fishery and tourism. People from all over Canada and the U.S. keep boats here. For five years, Carolyn Parsons has been fighting Ottawa to remove the oil in the rusting ship. Seals were dying on the ice, uh, birds were dying, uh, that hundreds, hundreds and hundreds, we, untold. I mean, that's just what we saw and, you know, there's a lot of the area that is not inhabited, right? Sitting on the ocean floor 70 meters below, the Manolis L, with some 150,000 liters of oil still inside. A leaking time bomb, threatening marine life and industry. The salvage vessel sits above the wreckage. Over the next four weeks, its crew will complete the delicate task of pumping that oil off the sunken ship. The hose will pump it out back aboard the ship. The Coast Guard invited us along to show how it's being done. It's important to the people that live here, the stakeholders, the local communities, and to ease their mind on the risk that it, it, it exposes them to in their economy and their livelihood. They're relying on remotely operated vehicles to attach hoses to the ship to pump the oil out. Divers were just too risky. 
but it limits the uh, time that you can spend on the bottom, the amount of work that can be, achieve, be achieved in a specific day, but also there's a larger risk. Coast Guard vessels stand by at the ready. They've got equipment to capture any oil that might leak into the water during the removal process. They definitely played a large role in us being here today. The operation will cost $15 million and should be completed in roughly four weeks. Parsons is breathing a sigh of relief, knowing their campaign paid off. We're feeling really good about the work we've done and, and we're really pleased that it's, it's going ahead. Finally, after three decades, the threat of oil fouling this magnificent stretch of coastline will be no more. Chris O'Neill Yates, CBC News, off Change Islands, Newfoundland. The Manoas L isn't the only derelict ship sullying Canada's coastlines. In fact, there are an estimated 600 abandoned vessels polluting our waterways. Last fall, the Liberal government introduced a bill that would, for the first time, make it explicitly illegal to abandon boats. If the bill becomes law, Ottawa will be able to go after the owners. Individuals can face fines up to $300,000 and six months in jail. Corporations could be fined as much as $6 million. Next on The National, two stories about people seeking safety and community. First, the LGBTQ advocates who spent their lives fighting for their rights who are now worried about having to go back into the closet in old age. Then meet the Indigenous youth finding a path and a passion in an extreme and exciting new sport. You feel good when, you, when you're on top of a horse, actually. Like, like all the time, too, even if I'm just at home, I'm just riding around in the field. I, I can just picture myself like in a track or something, a big crowd. And it means everything to me. Thousands of spectators lining the streets of Montreal and what organizers say is the largest pride parade in the French-speaking world. Today's festivities cap off two weeks of LGBTQ celebrations throughout the city. Among the politicians marching, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. We need to talk about acceptance. We need to talk about openness. We need to talk about friendship. We need to talk about love, not just tolerance. Indeed, LGBTQ Canadians have fought long and hard for equality in this country, but the gains they've made don't last for everyone, and many worry that as they get older, they're actually losing ground. Earlier this summer, our Nick Purden met up with three seniors who fear that in order to get the care they need going forward, they may just have to hide their pride. My name is well, David Bizdell. And who am I? Well, I'm an older gay man. Um, I'm having a hard time, I guess, making that transition to, from being young to being old. When I'm dreaming, I'm young. In my dreams, I'm young. When you look in the mirror, what do you see? I see an old man. I see somebody that I didn't want to become. I'm not afraid of dying. I'm, what I'm afraid of is the time from now until the time that I do die. Um, and the way I see it right now, uh, going into a senior's home, it's, it's, it's not going to be easy and it doesn't, it's, it's not going to be any fun. I mean, do you worry that people might treat you differently because you're gay? I do. And I think it uh, would be unjustified. What is the worry? Isolation that they won't accept me. Imagine feeling that at the end of your life. Now, one of the problems, and seniors will tell you this, is that you become more and more invisible as you age. That's why Leslie Lee Cam does whatever she can to be seen. I'm a very proud queer dyke, as you can see. I wear my dyke t-shirt proudly. And this is my buddy, Lily who goes everywhere with me, especially, I want to show you, on the dance floor. <laughs> Leslie is a youthful 64, oh. and one of the things Lily, her cane, does for her is remind Leslie of the time she spent in a Toronto rehab hospital a couple of years ago. 
This one nurse came in and said to me, look at you, you're a mess. It's bad enough that you're one of those, and now I have to come and clean you up. And it was humiliating because I had no control and I had to totally depend on her. And for the whole time she was cleaning me, she kept making homophobic remarks. Kept saying, you know, you, you don't have a husband, you don't have children, where do you think you're gonna go in life? It's, it's bringing tears to my eyes just thinking about it. If I'm there for good health care, it shouldn't matter who I am, right? What my sexual orientation is. That shouldn't matter when you're providing me health care. Listening to Leslie, I can't help but wonder why aren't LGBT seniors protesting? Well, Leslie points out that it wasn't until 1969 that it was even legal to be gay in this country. So if you're 70 years old today, you remember that. Many of us are afraid because we have been so stigmatized for so many years at this age, those of us who are 55 and 60 plus are still afraid to speak out. We are people just like everybody else, but we have led such stressful lives and some of us still do. We don't have the support systems that straight seniors have in place. And that's why we are going back into the closet. After struggling to come out, LGBT seniors get to the end of their lives and face a horrible choice. We are having to decide whether we want to come out and be our whole selves or we want to get good health care. Would you ever go back into the closet? Never. <laughs> Never. Nope. It's going to be a fight to the end. But here's the thing. Leslie's not fighting by herself. Over the years, many of people in our LGBT community have been wounded. They've been wounded because they've been discriminated against. That's Brian Hobbs. He's 69, retired. And his passion today is to make people aware of the discrimination that LGBT seniors face going into care. Everyone in this seminar either works or volunteers with seniors. They might feel threatened to come here and be part of things. Or and they might hide. They might pretend to be straight and they're not. The reason Brian does this is deeply personal. And it actually starts way back in high school, when he was left to eat alone in the cafeteria every day. Nobody looked at me, not even the teachers. They'd walk past, and it's like I didn't exist. What if the same thing happened in a residence? What if people didn't welcome me at their table? What if I was the one who sat alone at a table in the corner of the room at 79? So that happened to me when I was a teenager, but I sure don't want it to happen again when I'm a senior and in care. In the seminar, to help workers understand that fear, Brian uses an anecdote that happened just a few months ago. I had some friends who were a, a, an elderly gay couple around 80 years old, and eventually one of them became ill and had to be placed in a, a long-term care facility. And one of the things they asked me was that, you know, could you stand in the doorway and if a personal service worker or a nurse would go by, signal us. Because we don't want to be seen holding hands or embracing, you know, on the bed. Because they were afraid if the nurses caught them doing that, they would discriminate against them. People will sometimes say to us, okay, so what do you gays want? And what we want is to be treated with the same dignity and respect and kindness that is accorded to everybody else. Nothing more than that, but nothing less. So thank you for listening. Brian's hope is pretty simple, that LGBT seniors can be whoever they want to be when they go into long-term care. Would you ever go back into the closet? No. I'd, I'd just be who I am. I'm not flamboyant. I'm not, uh, I'm not one that I, I don't think I'm one that you can pick out on the street and say, he, there's a, he's a fag. You know, I, just, I just feel normal, except that I'm gay. Uh -huh. The seniors who are facing what David's up against are the same seniors who fought for gay rights for all generations. It seems only fair they should live how they want in their final years. Nick Purden, CBC News, Toronto.
community and culture are at the heart of our next story too, but in a very different way. What you're seeing here is called an Indian relay race, an extreme sport that started in the US and is now spread to Canada. There's plenty of speed and skill involved, but no saddles, no safety equipment. And most jockeys competing in the race are under the age of 35. As Olivia Stefanovic found, the sport is steering young riders onto the track and away from trouble. I'm here to race. That's my goal. Like warriors preparing for battle, these horse riders keep a cool exterior. Oh, God. As they mask their jitters with paint, then head to the start line. Go! In this relay, riders make three laps, exchanging painted horses. Each ride is bare back. The chaos is captivating, and it's catching on. Indian relay has been taking place in the United States for decades but only recently spread up to Canada for the Indigenous Games. Now it's become a weekly gathering of nations. Fans pack the stands even in the cold rain. What makes this race so special is the people in itself. Everybody's trying to win and there's no fixing any kind of races. Like I said, the races, these horses spin a couple circles, that guy's gone, bang. It's the adrenaline rush. I've not known what's going to happen. Tyson Head is the reigning Canadian champion. Yeah. He's training new riders to take the lead. They follow me around and I trim horses, and like I said, and they, they want to do it. And it's a good inspiration having to use, do something with their time. They're always here. They never go. You can't, can't even leave them home because they'll find a ride here. <laughs> Racing has become a passion for many. Growing interest in the sport is an opportunity to pass on customary skills to young people. And feel proud, teaching all the boys back home how to ride and everything. Well, it keeps them out of trouble. At least they're working with horses and you know they're going home every night, so. How important is knowing that? Oh, makes me, make them, at least I know they're safe. But the high-speed, heart-thumping relay heats can be dangerous. We gotta lose horse there. Hang on, there, guys. Cal Jackson is healing after being run over by a thoroughbred during an exchange. This is what we signed up for, and we have to pay the price. You feel good when, you, when you're on top of a horse, actually. Like, like, all the time, too, even if I'm just at home, I'm just riding around in the field. I, I can just picture myself, like, in a track or something, a big crowd. And it's, it means everything to me. I, I died doing this sport. He's so passionate about Indian Relay because it prevented him from getting caught up in the wrong crowd, giving him a purpose and a new way to connect with his culture. The risks, though, aren't dampening enthusiasm for this revived traditional sport that many hope will inspire the future. Olivia Stefanovic, CBC News, Soto First Nation. Next on The National, this week's dispatch. Four years after dramatic and determined protests for democratic rights in Hong Kong, Sasha Petrasek shows us a movement that is diminished, but certainly not defeated. I got to be, uh, speak loudly, boldly, and I can't back down because I am standing for freedom of expression and freedom of, uh, of press. But first, Kevin Spacey hits an all-time career low at the box office with Billionaire Boys Club. It's worth a quarter of a billion dollars. And your lives will never be the same. It's one of the last movies Spacey made before allegations of sexual assault made him box office poison, to say the least. Friday's theatrical release took in just $126 U.S. total. Do you think people really get rich playing by the rules? You probably remember the scandal broke last year. Actor Anthony Rapp accused Spacey of making unwanted sexual advances when Rapp was just 14, and then the dominoes fell. More than a dozen other allegations in the U.S. and in the U.K. Spacey was fired from his hit political drama House of Cards and removed from the J. Paul Getty biopic All the Money in the World, replaced by Canadian 
Christopher Plummer. How much would you pay to release your grandson if not $17 million? Nothing. Nothing. So back to Billionaire Boys Club, released on video on demand a month ago, often an indicator of low expectations at the box office. But that dismal $126 opening set a brand new low. The number of tickets sold, unlucky number 13, in just 10 theaters across the U.S. The movie made the most in Middletown, Connecticut, $45. Over in Antioch, California, just $9. Given the average ticket price, that likely means just one person in the audience. The truth is the best line. And it looks like Friday wasn't a fluke. Last night's box office take was only What are you doing? Nothing. Nearly four years ago, students in Hong Kong took a stand against China's leaders and cried out for democratic reform. A yellow umbrella became the symbol of their defiance. And the protests lasted for months until authorities clamped down hard. But the movement itself was never snuffed out. Remember, Hong Kong was in British hands for nearly a century. But since 1997, China has really tightened its grip. Today, to call for freedom is to risk official reprisal. In tonight's dispatch, Sasha Petrosek shows us who is standing up for Hong Kong. From the ferries in Hong Kong Harbor, you get an eyeful. Financial towers rising from bustling boat lanes. And from commuters on board, there's an earful on how China's squeezing this former British colony. Definitely mainland China, China government, they like to control Hong Kong for sure. Squeezing its traditional openness in ways few expected. You think you might lose some freedoms? Yep. That's the fear, prompting Andy Chan to push for Hong Kong's independence from China. What I want is that democracy for Hong Kong. Most here don't support separatism, and Chan's national party is a fringe. But it's considered enough of a threat to Beijing that it's on the verge of being banned on national security grounds, and Chan silenced. Hong Kong's Foreign Correspondents Club was pressured to cancel his speech last week, but it went ahead amid protests from Beijing supporters. And this time, I got to be uh, speak loudly, boldly, and I can't back down because I am standing for freedom of expression and freedom of, uh, of press, but not just about my party. Gradually, China has been chipping away at freedoms most in Hong Kong take for granted. Beijing supporters have been organized, funded, and placed in positions of power. Anti-Beijing voices have been intimidated and jailed. And any notion of democracy that could infect the rest of China has been blocked at every turn. The message from Beijing has been tough. Chinese President Xi Jinping came to deliver it himself last year. He said Hong Kong could keep some special privileges, but any attempt to endanger China's sovereignty or challenge the power of the central government would cross a red line and provoke sharp intervention. At the same time, Chinese authorities have been working in more subtle ways to limit dissent, using Hong Kong's own legal system to go after critical voices. They are clever in the sense that it seems to have a kind of a, 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 a facade of a rule of law. Mang Nok is a professor of government at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. Uh, this is a very dangerous precedent in, in terms of uh, it opened the gates for the government to actually uh, 
uh, further constrict the various freedoms of Hong Kong. Not so, says Ronnie Tong, member of Hong Kong's top-level executive council. He says the former British colony is just compromising to help out its new rulers. And if some of the give and take is that we must not offend national security of China, I don't see it as too high a price to pay for the rights and freedoms that we continue to enjoy. I think people would have to realize this. Pro-democracy activists like those who led mass protests here say Beijing is taking away those freedoms regardless. In 2014, tens of thousands blocked Hong Kong's roads for weeks to try to win more democratic rights before police moved in. Four years ago, during the umbrella movement, uh, there's tear gas, pepper spray. Joshua Wong was one of those student leaders, protesting right on this corner. Like others, he's since spent months in jail for demonstrating. He admits many Hong Kongers feel powerless. Now we are on a quite hard line pressure from Beijing. Even we can't mobilize people, so they block the road tomorrow, but the day will come. Except the space for political protest here seems to be shrinking by the moment. Sasha Petrosik, CBC News, Hong Kong. Still ahead on the national, meet a man determined to capture moments and memories with Canadian veterans of the Second World War before they're gone. About three and a half months ago, I left Victoria and started traveling east across Canada, trying to meet and interview as many Second World War veterans, male and female, I can find in our, uh, our beautiful country. On the anniversary of the Dieppe raid, he shares with us one veteran's incredible story of survival that day 76 years ago. That's our moment. Next. Yes. This is the place. How do we make money? How do we make money? We're good ideas. Oh, wow. It's amazing what you've accomplished. Yeah. Get great opportunities. I would invest in you in a heartbeat. Dragon's Den, Thursdays at 8 on CBC. Yo, Ma. Uh. What's a Netflix and that cheer? Sex. How you know that? Everybody know that. I don't know that. You is old. Young people talk. I listen. I learn. And I told her. Quebecers will elect again a new majority liberal government. Here are just some of the stories we're keeping an eye on this week on the national. Quebec's provincial election campaign kicks off on Thursday. Premier Philippe Couillard is looking for a second straight mandate, but the province's center right opposition party, Coalition Avenir Quebec, has a significant lead in the polls. Quebecers marked their ballots on October the 1st. The truck driver charged in the Humboldt Broncos bus crash will be back in court on Tuesday. Jaskirat Singh Sidhu of Calgary is charged with 29 counts of dangerous driving. He's been out on bail since July with a number of conditions, including a driving ban and surrendering his passport. 16 people died in the April crash after a semi-truck collided with the Saskatchewan Junior Hockey Team's bus. You pledged to take the cup to Humboldt. How much does that mean to you? Um, I mean, you know, uh, I, I knew uh, a couple of the guys on the bus, uh, so, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, uh, one of those things I want to do for those guys and, uh, you know, the people of Humboldt. And so on Friday, Saskatchewan native and Washington Capitals forward Chandler Stevenson will bring the Stanley Cup to Humboldt. Traditionally, every player on a cup-winning team is allowed to take the trophy to their home community for a day. There will be street hockey rinks set up so the kids can have the chance to play with NHL players and alumni. Now, 76 years ago today, Canada's Ken Curry was storming the beach at Dieppe. The failed offensive was one of the bloodiest battles Canada fought in the Second World War. Documentary filmmaker Eric Brunt is traveling across the country speaking with veterans. He believes it's important to collect these stories before it's too late. The filmmaker spoke with Curry about Dieppe, and his story is our moment of the day. When I'm swimming, there's little chinks of water around me. I thought they were fish, and they were bullets. They were shooting. They could see me swimming. 
I guess he gets taken by the current and he gets separated from his group. The tide had brought me into shore. I had got rid of all my clothes and boots, my revolver and everything I had. The only thing I had on was a pair of jockey shorts and my chocolate ration, which I had promptly ate, and a picture of my wife. As soon as he wakes to the shore, a German soldier comes. He thinks that if he hadn't been just in his underwear, that the guy might have shot him. He's brought to where the other prisoners of war are being held, and uh, he's, he sees someone he knows, and he says, my brother here is my brother here. He says both his brother and him are just in tears because they're so happy that, well, it's horrible that they're now prisoners of war of Germany, but they're together. His mom receives this telegram that says Ken is dead and Norman is missing, and they, I cannot even imagine what that woman must have felt when she saw that telegram. There's something about hearing history from the mouth of someone that was there that just makes it hit uh, home, I think, and make you feel those emotions and those experiences so much more. You know, and it is amazing that Ken and his brothers survived because 910 Canadians did not, and those memories are also so important because of a weird quirk. There was only one Canadian photographer at Dieppe, and it was so chaotic, he couldn't get off the boat. So most of the pictures we have were shot by German soldiers, oddly. That is The National for Sunday, August the 19th. Good night.